Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and this is <coughs> coffinite. Yep, that was lame, but that's okay. Coffinite is an interesting little mineral. It's a silicate that contains uranium and apparently can also contain thorium. Uh, but typically uranium, here it is. Doo -doo -doo. So this little guy right here is kind of interesting. It was sent to me ironically from New York, which is not usually where one finds coffinite. But it was sent to me by a person uh, on Twitter. Uh, Elijah, let me make sure I say your name by the way right. I am so terrible at saying names. It looks like Elijah. Um, I've seen it written, but I haven't heard it spoken. So if it's right uh, for wrong, you can like be all like, oh my god, you said my name wrong. You're a terrible person. But anyway, so yeah, I'm terrible with names. But here it is. Um, when I got this guy, I wasn't really sure how powerful it'd be, but one does not judge the potency of a rock the radioactivity of one anyway, by its size, because my most uh, radioactive piece of uranium is a little tiny thing compared to my big chunks which are sometimes not as radioactive. It really depends on the uh, activity of the actual rock itself, the density of uranium, that sort of thing. You can see it leaking a little bit. So we're going to test this guy using a gamma spectrometer. Now the gamma spectrometer uh, normally I have a, my lab, but you all have seen my lab before and all my lead shielding and everything like that. But the problem is right now I've got a whole bunch of stuff I'm trying to get fixed up down there and there's a whole bunch of stuff all over the place and it wasn't really working out. So I decided to do it up here in the same room where I just finished, if you follow me on Twitter you've seen this, I just finished my solar x-ray flare analysis up in this room. This little almost never used room in my house has the lowest background of any other room and it should be pretty good for doing an analysis of uranium because it's uranium. It's going to be potent enough, it's going to put off enough. We're not like testing milk to see if there's, you know, 0.4 becquerel per liter of cesium-137 or something like that. We're testing uranium so it's going to have a nice potency to it. You're going to easily see on the spectrum and you're not going to have any troubles with, with, with picking anything out. So let's take a look quickly and see the properties of this guy, like what it shows up as on the uh, detectors and things, and then toss it under the spectrometer. Now let me start out with, um, with this. Putting it up against the Polymaster, I got almost nothing. The Polymaster doesn't even burp. Nothing. Not a thing. And the reason is, is because this thing's putting off mostly alpha, and the Polymaster is blind to alpha. This thing's putting off mostly alpha. It puts off a little gamma, a little x-ray, a little beta, mostly alpha. I'll show you in a minute how I know that, by the way. But, but anyway, first, um, I'll just de declare that by fiat. I mean, I'll literally show you. So let's see what we get as a background lens on the um, uh, Ludlum. So in the Ludlum, we're on the times 10 mode. So this represents 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 thousand counts per minute. Put it on slow mode for a second. You'll see that we're somewhere around... Let me just zoom this up for you guys to see, get the focus right in there. We're somewhere around um, about a thousand counts per minute or so, okay? And in fact, let me, since the focus is pretty good on this right here and it looks pretty nice, let me see if you can see that reasonably well. Yeah, that's pretty good. Let's take this right now and I'll just in the background you can kind of see it. Let me just kind of put this up against the rock sample and see what we get. Urgh, rock sample. And increase the speed a little. Might have gone up a little bit. Oops. Maybe a little bit. There it goes. A little. Move it away, it should go down. Let's see if it goes down. Or if I'm fooling myself. No, it didn't. It, it went up a little. Let's put it back to slow mode. So, 100, 200. Somewhere around two to five hundred maybe counts per minute is if I take the highest that I saw on the on the uh, scintillator. Now this is a one inch sodium iodide scintillator, a Ludlum model 12 or 8 meter with a 44-2 scintillator. I love this thing by the way, it's so nice and rugged and rough and tough and stuff. I love how rough and tough the, the, the Ludlum is. And they didn't pay me to say that, I quite literally just think it's awesome. Boy, I wish they'd sent me that guy right there for free, but nope, it costs way too much money. Anyway, so it doesn't show up in the Polymaster, but that's not really what the Polymaster's for anyway. It's for like detecting things like cesium-137, which it does a really great job of, I might add. So let's take it and put it against the Geiger counter and see what we get. So let's put the Geiger counter here, put something underneath it so you can see it. Make sure we're in focus, fo fo focus, fo focus. And then let's put this up against it and see what we get. Now, you'll see that we're getting readings off of the Geiger counter just fine. And the reason, of course, as I already said, it's because the, uh, well, the what's coming off here is mostly alpha. Now, I'm going to prove that to you in a minute by putting a piece of paper in between the detector and the sample. 
Now, a piece of paper is just typically enough to block alpha radiation. That's the reason why we use the paper. I mean, you could use a you know four-inch slab of lead if you like, but the problem is then it would block everything else. You wouldn't really know. And the hottest I've gotten off of this, by the way, is about 180 counts per minute. This side right here seems to be about the hottest. I've already tested this before I came here with it. So let's take the paper towel now and stick the paper towel here and then stick this on the other side of the paper towel and see what we get. And we're getting radiation off of it, even with the paper towel. But we're not getting as much. So as you can see, we're getting a good amount of this from alpha. And it's likely the next most likely thing we're getting is beta. And those are from the daughters most likely if the uranium hypothesis is correct. If it's truly uranium, or even thorium for that matter, we'd be getting lead and bismuth uh, uh, betas. So we need to throw this now in the spectrometer and see what we get from it. And maybe some up close photographs of it too. It is kind of a nifty little dark sample. So let's look at the spectrometer. All right, so there's my dirty screen. I really wish you'd clean that off a little bit, but you see the spectrometer right here and you can see there's a cesium-137 peak right down the middle right there. That's from 661 keV gammas. And there's an x-ray peak going up right over here and these are x-rays. And then of course you have the uh, uh, Compton Edge, the Compton Plateau, the Backscatter Peak, the Lead XRF uh, Peak, and all that kind of stuff. So everything you'd expect to see from your standard, you know, run-of-the-mill uh, CC-137 spectrum. And that's good, because we're going to use that to calibrate the actual detector. Now, let me show you what we're running it up against. So here, by the way, you see is the universal spectrometer, UCS-30. Nice piece of hardware right there. Um, now look at this right here. So we have a one inch sodium iodide detector here. I've got the camera right in front of my face. See, one inch. And this guy right here is a uh, uh, gamma detector. Focus. It detects gamma rays. It is a 10 stage photomultiplier tube. One and a half inch sodium iodide thallium dope scintillation detector. Focus, 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 focus. And let's try to get this back inside. And we're shielding it with lead. And you saw the Season 137 sample just popped out, this little guy right here, which I use to do the calibration. Calibration, there it is. This guy right here is, this is a tiny bit of Season 137, by the way, friends. Very tiny. It's uh, a one-tenth of a microcurie for you guys in America. And for everybody else in the uh, physics world, it is, uh, let's see, 3.7 kilobecquerels, at least when it was originally made, and it's been decaying since then. However, it has a 95% confidence interval based on a mixed gamma NIST traceable source. So this little sucker is pretty accurate. And if you put it anywhere near the polymaster, the polymaster goes immediately monkey bananas over it. See? Monkey bananas. 100 counts per second and rising, depending on if we get it right over the sweet spot. Oops. She would have been better if we hadn't hit that button. And uh, it's giving off nearly a single microsievert of background. This will calm down to about maybe a little bit less than this. Comes to like 1.2 or something if you calculate both sides. But anyway, not too much. So, there's that. Focus. Now this guy right here is a 1 millimeter by 25 millimeter cesium iodide x-ray scintillation probe, a RIP-47 from uh, SE International. Yay, SE International. And we're going to put this up here against the sample at the same time, and we're going to um, actually capture the sounds from it. I may even decide to instead use the actual big detector there and run these guys through this. Oops. Let me move this over here. This right here is a B Research Gamma Spectacular. So this little dude, <laughs> civil defense, this little guy right here is a, a low cost, if you like, spectrometer. These guys are like two, two or three hundred bucks. So if you want to do gamma spectroscopy on a, on a dime, this guy right here is a really great buy as far as I'm concerned. And this guy right here, I can use this with this, uh, with this guy right here in PRA software, I can actually convert the gamma rays and x-rays to sound. So the higher energy makes a higher sound and the lower energy makes a lower sound. And then we can hear what this thing is seeing, if you like. So, uh, to anthropomorphize the detectors a little. And what I'm going to do is play that at the same time that the, that the spectrum rises and let you guys in, uh, actually hear and see kind of at the same time. So, uh, without further ado, let's get to the spectrum.
All right, so the spectrum looks pretty clean. This looks like exactly what we'd expect. So let's go and explain quickly uh, what all these little parts are. On this side, the left are low energy gammas and x-rays. And as the energy goes up, that was detected, a count was deposited in a higher or higher and higher and higher bin. So up here are the highest bins or channels, if you like, depending on how you want to say it. At a, apparently 1,474 keV. I know that's actually a little bit wrong because I see the Compton edge here for uh, potassium 40. So this calibration is a little bit drifted off over here on this end, but it was a linear calibration between two points. So, you know, what do you expect? So let's move down over here and take a peek. Okay. What do we have here? First up is this guy right here, bismuth 214 at 609.31 keV, bismuth 214. Now these next three right here, this one, this one, and this one, these guys are from lead 214. This one is 238.63. This one is 295.21. This is 351.92 keV. That's lead 214, which decays, of course, after a bit into bismuth 214 and so on. And it's one big happy family. All right, this guy right here is radium 226. Remember the uh, radium girls that used to paint the uh, watches, the poor unfortunate fate which befell them? Uh, this is exactly the material they used right here. So, radium-226, that's inside of the rock. And um, and I don't mean the wrestling guy of the rock. I'm talking about the little stone I was messing with. This right here is lead fluorescence. You know how you take like a, a shirt that's neon green and you shine a black light on it or a piece of paper that's white and it reflects back at you super bright in the middle of the night because it, it's fluorescing? Well, x-rays are also photons, just like UV light, and they cause metals to fluoresce. In this case, they fluoresce in the x-ray spectrum, see? So here we go. This guy right here is 7580, somewhere in there, KEV, that's from lead. Uh, you might notice a little bit of a, let me just kind of highlight the whole area. Let's do this. See this whole area here? This little bump right here? This is probably, let's see, where does it say it is? It says it's at 4745. It's probably lead 210 off the top of my head. I think that's probably lead 210. And these little guys down here are probably 13, 20, and 13 keV um, uh, X-rays that are XRF that come from probably uranium. Uh, that's probably lead 210 right there. So this is absolutely perfect spectrum for uranium. There's 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 no thorium in this. This is this is straight up through and through uranium all the way. Perfectly natural. You find it all over the place. Nothing weird. Nothing crazy about it. It won't really hurt you too much. A sample like this, it's too low level to do anything. I mean, you could throw the rock at somebody, that might hurt. But other than that, it's not going to do too much. But it is definitely a nice, clean sample. And look how nice it comes out. Look how nice. That's 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 actually pretty good. So here's a logarithmic view. You can see the Compton Edge uh, plateau and uh, Compton Edge and uh, plateau here forming for the potassium 40. And this guy right here is probably from like actinium or something like that. And there should be some business peaks going up that direction, but whatever. So there you go. So thank you again, Elijah, for the sample. It was pretty awesome. Uh, it tested it out. Sorry it took so long. I've been really busy recently. But, you know, I'm getting back in the saddle and all. So uh, this has been Tom from anti-proton.com. Bye-bye.